change. It's good. It's out there and it worked on data and it was good. Yep, we're done with that. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is James Stemp, and I um, first was interested in surface metrology specifically for use for applications based on archaeological uh, stone tools. So, um, my, my initial foray into this area started about 15 years ago when the technology wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is now. So I um, first started out with a laser profilometer. They could only give me two-dimensional measurements that were reasonably good. Um, but clearly, as the technology has advanced, the ability to generate very complex three-dimensional uh, scans of different surfaces, and then the uh, complex algorithms that you can apply to them make it possible for you to obviously extract a sub substantial amount of quantitative data associated with useware. So uh, for those of you who may or may not be archaeology, anthropology folk in the crowd, um, if you have done work with useware in the past, one of the issues that you know uh, has been associated with useware is the criticism of its qualitative nature. That it used to be, I look through the microscope, I see qualitative characteristics, I describe them in a series of uh, somewhat specific ways, but that the analysis of useware was very much analyst dependent. So what one person saw, another person might not see or the criteria that somebody used to establish the, um, the general criteria for determining what the, the motion type or the contact material type was like was, was going to be based on a, a certain set of criteria that they, they may have generally shared with others, but they tended to fine tune the system to suit their own, their own particular style, their own particular approach. Um, which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing in terms of developing useware uh, analysis uh, methods. The problem has clearly been the ability to somehow share those data uh, across the board with, with different useware analysts. Uh, if there's no one standard system being used, it's hard to compare data to, to one another. So um, really my interest was in sort of the next step because I had been a you know, sort of traditionally trained useware analyst. It was the microscope. I had my descriptions. I wrote down on sheets of paper all the stuff I saw and you know, did all the, the things I was supposed to do. But um, there was that, that sort of nagging issue of what is the reliability of what I'm doing? You know, how accurate am I being in certain instances? And depending on the development of the where, what could you or could you not say with any degree of reliability? What, um, what you know is if, you, if you've done use for before is uh, clearly there's a relationship between um, the duration of use, the raw material from which the, the tools are made, and then clearly the, um, the um, resistance of the material from which the contact materials are made. So uh, if you think about things like polish development or rate of polish development or wear development, typically harder materials develop polishes faster uh, and uh, less resistant materials or softer materials tend to develop the polishes more slowly. Um, and if you know that, then you can somehow account for or uh, adjust your interpretations when you're looking at use wear on, on certain archaeological tools. There's always been that sort of comparison of the experimental to, to the archaeological. And for reasons of, of time and, and post-depositional processes, there's always that distance between the two, where one, you can't completely overlay uh, on top of the other. But um, where this started to become a, a big problem was with the idea that clearly length of use or duration of use and then the resistance of the, the material would clearly directly impact on the production of wear. For, um, for me in the area in which I work, this problem uh, essentially emerged in such a way that I was looking for a, a potential method to overcome an obstacle that had to do with identifying certain use wear patterns that suffered from issues of length of use and the, let's say, less resistance of the contact material. In this case, it's the old idea of uh, ancient Maya bloodletting. Um, the tools arguably are not used that long and they are contacting a material that's not very resistant. So what we suppose should occur, and through experimentation we can generally um, replicate what we expect, is that the, um, the wear on the tools for the most part is almost non-existent. So 
in order to document whether or not certain tools were being used for specific functions rather than inferring that this is most likely what they were used for, this project is trying to get to that next step. Is there a way to somehow generate information that can confirm that um, an obsidian tool was used for a very short term activity, possibly contacting soft material? And then not what I'm doing here, but hopefully another step is can you ascertain that what has been contacted was one material versus another. Um, so we're really at this can you see where stage first. The next one is can you assign the where to a particular contact material in a quantitative way. So uh, just a little bit of background for those of you who are, are not quite familiar with, with the ancient Maya. Um, classic period ancient Maya, roughly 700 to 900 AD, um, are argued to have engaged in a series of ritual activities, uh, most of which have them contacting their ancestors or the gods, making appeals to them to do things uh, on their behalf. We know of a lot of this information through a variety of different sources. And uh, you know, very quickly, I'll just run through kind of a laundry list of the sources of information that have been used in the past to, to generally argue for the existence of bloodletting ritual among, among the ancient Maya. So um, we see that a number of the examples for um, this particular activity are based on iconography and artwork. And it's the interpretation of those individuals who specialize in iconographic analysis to look at certain images and um, assume or at least confirm based on things like um, the inclusion of hieroglyphic text that what in fact is going on is what you think is going on based on, um, based on the artwork. So two different examples, uh, both from the Maya world, uh, Stila 22 at Tikal, which is a large uh, carved stone monument, and then lintel 2 at La Pasadita, which is essentially a, a piece of the architecture that's sort of stuck in the wall. Um, you have two bloodletting events um, that are being performed by kings. Uh, they're generally replicating the same kind of thing. The important uh, piece that I want you to concentrate on is this what looks like to be scattering of beads or dropping of beads is the iconographic equivalent to drops of blood or bloodletting. So one of the pieces of evidence used to argue for bloodletting activity um, in these attempts to contact the supernatural or the ancestors comes from the artwork. Um, and we have uh, multiple examples of uh, sacrifice in this way by individuals who are attempting to let their own blood to somehow contact uh, the supernatural world. We also get artifactual evidence that is argued to be associated with uh, the same kind of activity. So uh, here you have uh, the illustration of the inside of a, of a uh, sort of shallow dish that's recovered from a cave in Belize that's called Chenpish Cave. What you have associated with this dish is a painting sort of in the bottom and you have again a, a probably noble or royal individual who is depicted with little drops of blood coming from his hand. In association with the deposit, you also have the recovery of an obsidian blade. The assumption is that the blade and the plate are connected to one another in some ritually significant way. Um, because we know that caves were significantly important locations for um, the Maya to contact their ancestors or to contact the, um, the gods, that the location of the obsidian blade and the plate in part is what strengthens the argument that this is going to be a, um, a bloodletting ritual location or, or at least scene. So context here plays a significant role in the interpretation. This idea of caves being ritually significant places, in fact caves are thought to be entrances to the underworld and there's a whole mythology that's built up around that. If you go to a second cave in Belize, Aktun Tunichil Muknal, what you actually get is a much more um, concrete example of this association between caves, ritual, bloodletting, and contact in the supernatural. So what you have on a ledge in the cave, in this case, are a series of what are called megalithic stones. So um, you have a pile of um, stalagmites and stalactites from the cave, and then within them, inset is a very sort of tall uh, slate monument, and then a second very tall slate monument. They're argued to be depictions of uh, a stingray spine and an obsidian blade both of which are um, known to have been used as bloodletting implements by the ancient Maya. What, what strengthens the argument is that slate is non-native to the cave. Someone had to bring slate a very long distance into this underground location. So it's not a naturally occurring stone here. So 
the assumption is that the ancient Maya placed these things here for ritual significance, that they're associated with bloodletting activity of some kind, um, and they put tremendous effort into moving large pieces of stone through an underground series of passageways. Uh, there are what I'll call water obstacles along the way to place them strategically in a ritually significant spot. Yeah, so the argument here is that um, the sides have been shaped, that they, they actually either carve or choose a piece that has this uh, linear spine that's reminiscent of the spine that you'd see down the midline of, of an obsidian blade. And that this one is clearly notched in a way that it, it very closely resembles uh, what obsidian spines look like, or I should say, a stingray spines look like. So, um, if I show you the examples archaeologically, um, you can see that those particular monuments actually come pretty close to, to the real thing. So here, we know um, that there's also uh, uh, ethnohistoric reference to the use of these implements, and we recover these implements from uh, my archaeological deposits. So here, uh, this particular blade, obsidian blade, um, comes from a deposit that's right around here. So you have a spatial association. Um, Stingray span, spines like these have been found or been recovered at a variety of Maya sites, typically in ritual locations. We also have sort of stylized blood letters. This one is actually carved out of jade, but the blade is um, modified in such a way that it looks like it's symbolically supposed to be reminiscent of, a, of an obsidian uh, spine. And then we have some um, pottery figurines, something like this, that depicts what appears to be, again, a, a noble or royal individual who's in the process or about to engage in the process of bloodletting and drop the blood into the bowl. Uh, typically, the blood would drip down onto bark paper and that bark paper would be burned. And the idea is that the smoke, as it dissipates in the, into the atmosphere, is somehow absorbed or consumed by the, the gods or, or the ancestors. I think I had a question, sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any residuals on any of the tools. Um, it depends. What we see is that, um, for the most part, the obsidian blades themselves haven't, haven't historically been tested for uh, residues to the degree that they probably should. Let's put it that way. Uh, there are some instances where we know residue has been recovered from the blades themselves, but there's very little in the way of what I'll call um, evidence that positively points to contact with uh, blood or tissue or any, anything that would somehow connect it to bloodletting activity that, that's associated with people. Other residues have been recovered, but, but not typically those ones. There's one specific exception I'll mention a little bit down the road, um, but it's, it's clearly the exceptional case. And then uh, a fourth source of information produced by the Maya themselves is the decipherment hieroglyphic text. And what we see is that um, really getting rolling in the 1960s into the 70s, that's when um, you get the right combination of people who manage to crack what is essentially, you know, sometimes stereotypically called the Maya code and figure out how this language system really works. From there, you've had the consistent decipherment and redecipherment of glyphs by a number of other people over the course of time. Um, we're to the point now where there's a substantial quantity of this uh, glyphic information that can be interpreted or deciphered. Uh, what we see are some very specific references uh, to blood that shows up on monuments and other objects. Uh, usually this reference to blood has something to do with a scene or an activity that, that shows someone and there's a verb associated with it that indicates that they are somehow uh, providing or scattering or, or otherwise sharing blood in some capacity. So, I mean, we have a lot of information that surrounds the activity um, associated with the blades themselves, but as I said before, we don't really have a lot that comes from the blades themselves. And then, um, lastly, um, you know, kind of round out our, our what I'll call uh, circumstantial evidence. Uh, we know that um, archaeologists who, who deal with populations that are kind of still around when uh, colonizing peoples show up and do bad things to them, uh, often will have records kept for a variety of reasons. The Maya are no different. What we see uh, very famously are the accounts of Archbishop Diego de Landa from the 16th century. Um, he writes a book, uh, not so much because he's, he's concerned about uh, saving aspects of past Maya cultural activity. Uh, this is a book that he writes in self-defense. Uh, 
because he's on trial for his mistreatment of the Maya in the area that, that he was in control of. So uh, part of why he pulls this thing together is to sort of say, look, I'm not a bad person. Uh, you know, look at, look at what I've done and, and look at all this good information I have for you and please, you know, don't do anything too badly to me. But what we see is that in his observation of ritual activity um, and in other activities conducted by, by ancient Maya population, he clearly has references to ritual activity in which, um, and these are only uh, a few of them that I pulled out of the text, and there are other texts that also exist. He pulls out um, clear statements that he makes of individuals somehow um, producing their own blood and then involving that blood in a variety of uh, different kinds of activities. Uh, there's a long sequence of activities that have them anointing idols with their own blood for, for ritual purposes. Part of the problem a little bit with using the ethno-historic data is that there's a, a little bit of a time gap here. So if we're talking about the classic period Maya, we're talking, you know, if I really narrowly box it in, about 700, 900 AD. By the time um, he's making his observations, you're into the um, 1500s. So culture changes over time. Just because you have accounts that are observed by someone in the 1500s doesn't necessarily mean that translates back 600 years. So there's always a little bit of a caveat here in terms of you know, how reliably can you connect the dots. But um, generally, these ethno-historic uh, sources, where they're available, are, are used or are relied upon. So when dealing with um, traditional means of trying to identify use wear on obsidian blades, so the old metallographic microscope, the incident light, uh, you know, getting your little digital camera up top there and taking some photographs, um, these are the kinds of results that you produce on um, archaeological samples. So what we see is uh, on these samples that they are hypothetically, possibly, uh, associated with um, bloodletting activity, but this is clearly not conclusive because you're really basing on the lack of evidence as opposed to the presence of evidence. So on this particular obsidian blade, you really have almost, in fact, you have no surface wear that's, that's observable at all. Um, you do get a little bit of edge nibbling down here, relatively small scale. On this example, um, you also have pretty much no surface wear at all. Uh, and you get a little bit of edge nibbling here. This big chunk uh, is, is post-depositional, so it's not associated with use. So part of the identification of potential bloodletting tools is the fact that you don't see wear on them. And a lot of the um, reconstruction of their associations is mostly contextual. So the idea is that where I find an obsidian blade in a ritually significant place that I suspect uh, would have been a location where bloodletting is occurring. Um, the assumption by default is that these are probably bloodletting tools, which uh, is clearly not necessarily the, the, the appropriate or the correct interpretation. But this is something that has tended to, to persist, um, primarily based on the fact that there are no, there haven't been any other means by which you can identify whether they're used or not used conclusively, and um, whether they were used specifically, obviously, in some sort of bloodletting activity. So uh, this is one area of concern of mine, because I was one of the people who, who's fallen into that kind of, oh, I won't use the word trap, although I just did, um, of relying on context overwhelmingly to somehow interpret blades that, for the most part, don't really look used that much. But the argument is, well, why or how are these blades getting here and why are they being associated with, with ritual activity or ritual space um, if they're not being used? Are they just simply votive offerings where I take a blade and I put it there and yeah. that's it? I guess that was my question. Yeah. Whether maybe they weren't, these ones weren't actually used that you have to find out the ones that are being used are you know, at larger sites or... Yeah, I mean, th this is part of the issue is how much of this is context, yeah, else. how much of this is um, the fact that you can or can't see evidence for you. So obviously on, on other obsidian blades that are used for longer periods of time or on harder materials for domestic or utilitarian functions, you do get well-developed wear and, and you can use those, those qualitative approaches very effectively. But for, for very short use tools and tools that, that contact very soft materials, you know, this potentially is, is a problem. And I think I'm trying to get out of the, the the trap or the mindset that I tended to have followed, which was the, okay, they could be 
bloodletting implement. So to sort of hedge your bets, usually what you would put is, uh, you know, in terms of is this used, you'd write something like indeterminate or inconclusive, and then in brackets put bloodletting question mark. Uh, you know, so you, you, you didn't uh, completely deny that there was any bloodletting going on, but you, you couldn't confirm it either. So to what degree that's a valuable statement at all is questionable, but this is really how people tended to deal with it because they weren't too sure, or they couldn't in some ways move beyond that particular point in time. So those are conchoidal fractures in the left. What are the linear fractures on the right? So these ones right here? Yeah, is it like these ones right? Uh, yeah, so as the waves of force move through, um, what we see is that depending on the properties, the, the microstructural properties of the obsidian, um, that you will get these kinds of, uh, they're actually uneven, what I'll call steps almost, but on a microscopic scale or, or a microtopographic scale, which it turns out, may actually be useful uh, when it comes to quantification. So a surface like this with some of these naturally occurring steps that are the product of fracture of that material, rather than a material like this that's very, very smooth, um, might make the difference, or at least preliminarily looks like it might make the difference in the ability to detect um, use where through quantification in one instance as opposed to not being able to see it in another instance. So. Although that's informative, uh, it does present another challenge, whereby the, the kind of microstructure of the raw material itself may or may not play a role in whether you can uh, later on uh, observe or at least track down use wear that's associated with short-term soft contact. But yeah, this difference and that difference, at least preliminarily, have turned out to matter as, as far as we can tell so far. So uh, again, not knowing who the audience would be, I kind of gave you a, a rough sort of uh, uh, cross-section of statements that use where analysts at different points in time have made uh, in association with their observations of, of what they think might be similar to bloodletting uh, use wear or um, proxies for use wear, such as something like cutting meat. So, you know, um, me and somebody else, uh, John Clark from BYU, Kazuo Ayama from Ibaraki University, and Linda Herkham, who I think is a chef. I don't know where she is right now. Anyway, um, they more or less, although the wording is slightly different, they're more or less saying the same thing. And what they're saying is there's nothing there, or there's hardly anything there. And um, I suppose on, on one hand it's nice that they're all seeing the same thing, uh, and, you know, there's some terminology that gets to be more standardized whereby, you know, weak polished development, uh, you know, uh, faint striations, whatever it is, at least there's some consistency there. But the, the lack of, of evidence that is very, what I'll call conclusive or um, much more obvious in terms of, let's say, matching a contact material and emotion with the use wear pattern that you see is, you know, problematic. So one of the issues that we know uh, just based on experimental uh, use of these things, and I've you know, hit the first two nail, uh, nails on the head uh, repeatedly already, but it's the length of time they're used. We, uh, we know that wear develops over time. So if you're not using the tool all that long, the time available for wear to develop is clearly shortened. The second is that um, in this case, human skin or uh, usually raw meat of some kind as a proxy for human tissue is not a very resistant material. So uh, you don't develop wear that quickly on, on those particular kinds of uh, materials. And then um, a tertiary concern here is that depending upon things like the fat content or the presence of blood within the, the activity in which you're engaged, which is obviously bloodletting, um, both of these substances can actually act as lubricants so that they will minimize the amount of wear they might otherwise form in a situation in which it's you know, a dry state. Um, so the fact that your intent is to produce blood obviously may throw a little bit of a wrench into the development of wear on bloodletting implements. So um, these were obviously concerns as we went into uh, the experiment. Uh, and this uh, really is sort of the, f the follow up into the experiments themselves. So what we see is that you can sometimes get residues on um, 
on Obsidian implements. These are implements, but they're not from the Maya world, or they're not from um, Maya culture. They're from a site called Canton in Mexico. Uh, and you're not dealing with Obsidian blades. Here you're dealing with large chip knives. And the arguments with these large chip knives is that they're probably used slightly differently. In this case, they may be used for sacrifice or they may be used for butchery. But this is an auto-sacrifice or auto-butchery. So the blades that I'm talking about would be used by an individual to cut themselves and, and let their blood. The argument with these is that they're used by someone on somebody else. Um, so the, the context is slightly different. But uh, in this case, what we see is that uh, trapped in uh, some of the cracks of the microfractures of these particular knives, you do get preserved traces of um, things like muscle tissue, collagen, and fibrin that can, in fact, be detected uh, under a scanning electron microscope. We also know that um, for variable reasons and at various levels of success, certain kinds of elemental uh, traces or certain kinds of actual um, substance traces, uh, you know, uh, blood residue analysis that, that's occurred in other places, has been effective at, at picking up these things on stone tools but not necessarily um, directly applicable to the uh, obsidian blades coming from the Maya world. As far as I know, there's really not anybody who's, who's had much success at doing that. So it is possible, given the right circumstances, but um, for the most part, we're not seeing widespread application or we're not seeing um, widespread successful results. So part of that probably has to do with, again, uh, taphonomic processes over time, whereby most of these organic materials or substances break down relatively quickly. Uh, the general environmental conditions uh, within the, the subtropics where most of the Maya sites are located uh, don't really provide the, the best uh, opportunities for blood or tissue to actually survive. So we, we tend to see organic preservation with, with some exceptional cases in, in the Maya world not be very good. Even human bone is pretty badly preserved. It's kind of mush most of the time. So you have some forces acting against you. Is this a desert um, This is more central Mexico. It's a lot drier than the area that I'm talking about, uh, at least from the central Maya lowland areas. So where does then the you know, quantification come into it? And, and this is really um, where the ball starts rolling in terms of, of what we have done and, and the direction in which we're heading. Um, we rely on, or we have relied on, to do a series of pilot study measurements uh, before measuring the obsidian blades associated with, with, with proxy bloodletting or proxy contact with, with tissue that's supposed to replicate human tissue. Um, we did some pilot studies that dealt with uh, simply figuring out whether a specific kind of measurement device, in this case, um, Alexed um, OLS 4000, so uh, laser scanning confocal microscope, how well it could actually uh, record surfaces on, on obsidian because there hadn't been much uh, previous work done in the area. Uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, um, the, the pilot study that we did a couple of years ago is the first to try out obsidian with, with the LEXT. And we got uh, good results uh, just in terms of being able to measure the surface and produce quantitative uh, microtopographical data. So step one was just can you get good measurements from, from the surface. Uh, from that, we were concerned with um, issues of, okay, if we can quantify the surface, um, what else can we do with the data that we have to try to extract information relative to um, different either worn or unworn surfaces? What sort of characteristics can we see based on uh, different scales of measurement? And this is where the application of uh, sort of fractal geometry or fractal analysis comes into it. Um, in particular, um, in part because we collaborated with uh, WPI on this, um, some of the work that was being done by, um, by Chris Brown ended up being the sort of the, um, the algorithmic uh, models that, w that we adopted, uh, simply because he had the software already written, uh, and he also had a whole slew of people who know how to use it. So uh, this, for our purposes, was a, is a, a good match. So uh, what we then did for these surface measurements is we calculated relative area. 
for um, the different surfaces on the different tools. And in this case, the relative area, um, and I'll show a slide that kind of uh, explains this a little bit better, is really a comparison of the calculated area on a surface through a tiling exercise that is, um, that is part of the software package. And in this case, what the tiling exercise does is it basically measures the number of tiles that are needed to cover a certain area. And as you um, decrease the uh, scale of measurement, what you see is that the size of the tiles decrease and the number of tiles that you need increases. What this allows you to do, though, is it allows you to measure surfaces at multiple scales. So if you're at very coarse scales, you're not really getting a lot of detail, but you're getting some detail. As you move down and you decrease the scale and the tiles get smaller and smaller and smaller, what you tend to get is uh, arguably greater and greater detail that's representative of how the, the surface structure looks. And, and obviously this is at a, an extremely small scale. We're talking at micrometer scale. Um, so this is the general uh, um, algorithmic application to the quantified data that we generated using LSCM. This is uh, sort of a, a reproduction of, of what this particular model attempts to do. So by looking at um, this measured surface using the LSCM, by applying um, applications, or I should say by applying measurements at multiple scales, what we get are um, different data that they go from um, large scale to small scale. But what we see is that certain kinds of surface modifications tend to show up as a possibly discriminated based on the scale of measurement. So some things that you can't see obviously at one scale, you, you start to be able to see at another scale. And the argument here is that certain scales pick up surface features that may be associated with the original topography of the stone before use and other scales, primarily the finer scales, seem to be able to pick up the microtopography of those features of the tools after use. So by comparing um, these surfaces at multiple scales, what you see is that some things show up at some scales that don't show up at others. And then the equation that essentially goes along with, with relative area, so I won't, I won't bore you with that one. So based on that knowledge, based on the use of the LSCM to just simply uh, produce surface data for quantification, uh, based on um, previous work done with relative area uh, by, by engineering students and other uh, engineers for industrial purposes, uh, we undertook a couple of years ago just a very basic experiment to see what kinds of results we could get. Um, so we took three flakes that are an app from obsidian, all coming from a, the same obsidian core to try to keep the raw material as uh, uniform or homogeneous as possible. We then used those obsidian tools um, basically to conduct the same activity for the same period of time. We, uh, we attempted to control for variables as much as we could. Uh, and then in that case, we uh, wanted to see really two things. On each one of the tools, could we distinguish the, a used surface from an unused surface? And then after that, could we compare the three used surfaces to one another and distinguish them from one another based on the contact material that they, um, that they were uh, used on? And this is really uh, the first sort of step on this in this sort of uh, application to Obsidian. Um, one of the areas that we're um, particularly concerned about had to do with uh, cleaning protocols. And we know that there are substantial disagreements about how are you supposed to clean uh, archaeological implements for use where, um, you know, what are the potential advantages or disadvantages of using certain approaches. Um, and I don't know necessarily what might be the best solution in all instances. Uh, we chose this particular protocol um, because it seemed to work for what we were going to do. And uh, it maybe sidestep potential complications by doing something else. So in this case, um, the tools were first washed using a fairly, uh, let's say, uh, grit-free detergent, so a liquid detergent. Uh, after they were washed, they were soaked in a 15% solution of um, hydrochloric acid for 15 minutes, um, mostly to get rid of any kind of inorganic stuff that was stuck on them. Clearly, there could be a potential problem with the organics. Um, but we uh, weren't necessarily too concerned with those at this point because both of, the, both of these samples were sort of old dry samples. Um, if they were kind of fresh samples, we might have been a little bit more concerned with, with the uh, organic residues. Some people would disagree with that. But. Anyway, after that we rinsed them all off, uh, we let them air dry, and then uh, obviously we tried to make sure we didn't get our fingerprints all over the, the surfaces. So after that, um, 
again, uh, some detail about uh, you know how we set up the experiment that's, that's maybe not as uh, important uh, for you at this point. But we used the LEXT. Uh, we decided on the, the 20 times objective. Um, again, there's been some disagreement about uh, which objective should you use. You, you clearly get um, higher magnification with a, a 50 times objective, but the area that you're measuring uh, shrinks considerably. So this debate about what magnification do you want versus what area you're trying to cover uh, is, is a little bit of a, 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 an issue to deal with. You can do some stitching, obviously, to get your, your areas together and make a, a bigger image if you want. But we decided to go with the 20 uh, in part because we were exploring options here. Uh, and we knew that the 20 had worked previously on other uh, lithic materials, so we figured we'd stick with, with what we knew. Um, fine pitch settings so we could get as much surface detail as we could, uh, which uh, tends to extend the length of time it takes for each individual scan. So uh, one of the issues that we found, uh, not so much with the obsidian, but when we applied this to a uh, much coarser structured material, uh, quartzite for example, is that quartzite takes a really long time to scan because it has such uh, a rough microtopography. So whereas you know, some of these obsidian blades that are quite smooth uh, maybe took three or four minutes, some of the uh, quartzite tools that uh, had the same surface area covered, we're getting into 35 minutes worth of scan time for a single scan, which, you know, if you're trying to get a lot of scans into a short period of time, becomes a little bit problematic. Um, this wasn't an issue for us necessarily because we didn't have to rent the equipment or, or rent people. We had what I'll call free access. But if you were paying to have to do this, 35 minutes versus four, uh, that, that makes a huge difference in terms of what you can accomplish on a certain budget. Yeah? Did you, um I actually used this yesterday, and I was, we only used the fast scan. Yeah. I guess, did you, did you try both ways to see if yeah, there was uh, like a noticeable difference? Yeah, what we did find was that the fast scan is clearly faster, yeah. <laughs> but you, you lose uh, some of the small scale detail. Yeah, um, so you, there was noticeable difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you quantify the data between your, your fine pitch setting and your slightly faster, um, let's say, scanning, the, the data aren't the same. So there is a difference. So you, you, what you gain on speed, you sacrifice a little bit, I think, on detail. Uh, but it also depends on what you're measuring. Yeah. You know, and the scales of um, detail that you're looking for. So depending upon the material, you, you might not need the very fine pitch setting. Um, you might be able to, to use something that's, that's uh, a slightly what I'll call less detailed. I also did some of the stitching too. We did the 50, but we actually stitched four yeah, together, yeah. which ended up being the same size. So I was sort of messing around with it. But, um. Yeah, and, and the only drawback with this, the stitching is, again, mostly time. You know, you have to take your four, yeah. and then you have to stitch them together. Uh, but if, if what you're trying to do requires um, higher magnification yeah. of smaller areas, then, th then that's the approach that works. So anyway, we, we could stitch 20s together if we wanted to. We could you know, stitch 50s together if we wanted, or 10s or 5s. Uh, but for our purposes, um, the 20 gives you uh, an area that's a little bit over uh, a half millimeter by a half millimeter. So you're getting a, a not bad size, hopefully capturing the area that, that you want to measure. So um, three scans, unused surface, and used surface. Statistically, three scans isn't great. You know, the number of scans should probably be higher, but we're mostly trying to figure out, you know, what kind of results can we get um, before committing ourselves more fully to, to uh, a larger project. And then we use relative area. And then we compared our relative areas to one another using F-test or, or mean square ratio just to get a, a confidence level in uh, determining whether or not the, um, the surfaces that we were comparing uh, we could somehow create some degree of what I'll call reliability in terms of our, our comparisons. And for our purposes, we set our confidence level at 95%. So, you know, if they're over the line, 95% reliable that, that the comparisons are valuable comparisons or that the discrimination is, is what I'll call believable or trustworthy. So if we um, just look at one of these particular obsidian flakes, um, what we get are, are kind of results sort of what we expected to get, knowing what we already knew about um, doing this on flint and other materials. In this case, what we see is that as the scale of measurement decreases, um, the relative area increases, which, which kind of makes sense. 
because if you think about the increasing number of tiles that you're putting on the surface, um, the more tiles you're putting on the surface should equate with uh, an increase in your relative area. So um, first and foremost, what we wanted to see was clearly this kind of upward sloping trend. If we weren't seeing it, um, there was a suggestion that there was some problem somewhere, that we weren't either accurately measuring the surfaces, that there was a problem with the actual measurement itself, or when it came to processing our, our quantified surface data, that something wasn't working with, with the relative area. But at least in this case, um, what we got were uh, the results we were sort of looking for. And what you can see, which is maybe more um, valuable here, is that the three area scans in, in this case, this is the unused surface, and the three area scans in the used surface can be um, distinguished from one another. So you have these used ones down here, you have these unused ones up here, and if you, if you sort of provide the mean for these, you can see that they do, uh, uh, they do uh, diverge from one another. They tend to diverge from one another around uh, here, so somewhere in this sort of one millimeter range is where we start to see them curve away. And this is fairly consistent when we look at um, surface measurements on, on other flakes as well. So just an example of, of what this earlier um, experimental work produced. And then if we compare the unused and the used to one another using uh, mean square ratios, um, this gives us a couple of interesting um, uh, sources of information. We see that discrimination is possible really at two different scales. So discrimination uh, at a fine scale and discrimination at a, a larger scale. So uh, these aren't two different surfaces. We're looking at the exact same surfaces, but the scales of measurement have changed. So what we see is where we compare them at these scales, they cannot be discriminated from one another based on the, the micro topographies of the tools. But at this area of large scale here and this area of small scale here, they can be discriminated. What, what this um, experiment and other experiments have generally uh, told us is that where you get discrimination here, the large scale discrimination seems to be associated with the differences between the natural properties of the unworn stone. So those stones are not going to be identical to one another in microtopography, even if they come from the same core. Um, elements of their manufacture, elements of, of micro inclusions will make those surfaces somehow different from one another. Those differences seem to get picked up here. Um, as we continue to um, uh, decrease the scale of measurement, what we then see is the ability to pick up even smaller scale differences in surface variation. And those smaller scale surfaces and surface variation um, appear to be the result of the modification of the surface after wear compared to the surface prior to wear. And to sort of demonstrate, or I don't know if I have a slide here, but to sort of uh, demonstrate that, that this seems to be the case, where we compared um, obsidian um, objects to one another without any wear at all, where there is no worn surface, there's only an unworn surface, what we get is that there's no discrimination at all here, but that the discrimination only occurs in this upper range. So as a sort of a secondary confirmation as to what may be accounting for these differences in the scale at which discrimination is possible, um, that second series of tests indicated that where you have no wear at all, these are both sort of pristine surfaces coming from the same core, they're not identical in terms of structure, that the differences in the unworn surfaces seem to be get picked up here. And then obviously if they're not used, we see really no discrimination at all at the lower end. Um, so are you you're able to, to differentiate between used and unused tools, but um, since it is unused and cratic, if you will, for the, the actual tool itself, can you differentiate them within unused and used? Um, you can do that test between those, like within group and test? Like, uh, you I, can't, I, yeah, yeah. So this, this is, so for example, um, this is a single tool, and this is the, um, Unused areas on that, that one tool, these are the used areas on that same tool. Oh, so you're testing across the entire surface of a single tool? We're sampling two different areas, so an area before use compared to an area after use. So this is the exact same tool, okay. but it's differences in surface structure um, on a single tool itself. 
But what we also can do clearly is compare the tools to one another. And what we see is when we compare the tools or we care, compare different tools to one another, uh, this is where we start to see that m most of our large scale discrimination uh, appears on the surfaces of two different obsidian tools that aren't used. Uh, and we see no discrimination at all possible uh, in the areas uh, where we would expect discrimination if the tools had been used. Um, and we could do the same thing on a single tool too. We can take different areas of unused surface and what we'll get is this, but we won't get this. So it seems to confirm what we think is going on, is that wear seems to be showing up at small scales. Um, any kind of microtopographical variation that's the product of either manufacture or the, um, the sort of properties of the individual surfaces themselves seems to show up in the higher scales. When we've done the same thing with flint, when we've done the same thing with quartzite, we generally get the same kind of, of pattern. The, the numbers are different, um, but the pattern holds. When you look at the, the shell, though, did you see, I mean, you'd expect the shell to have bigger influence on the surface texture. Yeah, and, and, and this is where... Um, did you see it move over? We do, but, but there's a problem with the shell experiment, but it was an experimenter problem. Uh, and I'll sort of get to that. So this is where the, although it's a, a system that has a lot of objectivity built into it, you're still choosing the places you want to measure. So if you don't choose the right place, you're not going to get the surface um, that's going to have the wear or not have the wear that you want. So in these early experiments, what we ran into was an issue of we chose in some cases the wrong place. And because we chose the wrong place, it's not as if the... Um, the LSCM didn't record what was there, it did. And it's not as if the relative area didn't calculate what it was supposed to calculate, and it's not as if the F-test didn't do what it was supposed to do. It's that we fundamentally goofed, and we chose the wrong place. Um, so that stressed, uh, obviously, to us that point selection uh, is critical in, in making this work. And until you develop a system whereby you eliminate people as the ones who choose where you're going to measure, there's always that human factor that's, that's an error factor in there. Uh, and here it is. This is the problem with shell. So what, in this case, it's not the three measurements, but we're just showing the means here. This shouldn't happen. I shouldn't get this crossover where um, my unused surface goes here and then it crosses my used surface. Why not? Well, what should happen is that um, the means of this surface should somehow be characteristically, in terms of their relative area, consistently different from... Um, those of my used surface. So if you think about this graph right here. Oh, oh, that might be the reason. So if you think about this graph right here, all of these that are in the used region uh, fall generally within the same range of recording the same relative area. And that's what you would expect if they're all measuring the same wear. In this case, they're red all measuring surfaces in unworn regions because they're supposedly getting the same surface they should be generally similar to one another so what we get here and I don't actually have the you know the, the six plots I only have the, the three is that somehow your individual plots are crossing over one another so that what should be a worn shell surface that is distinguishable from an unworn surface sometimes shows up in a region where you have unworn surfaces or you expect the unworn surfaces to be based on relative area. So the fact that you don't have a pattern that shows a fairly clear distinction in terms of relative area um, means that we, we did something wrong or at least means that the readings that we were getting didn't tend to make sense. And then um, if we then compared our relative areas, so our three uh, areas that are measured on uh, the U surface versus those that weren't, if we compared those using the F-test, what we found is that here's my 95% uh, um, confidence level. They didn't come close to discrimination. So visually we could see heavy wear produced on an edge based on shell, and we were comparing that to a surface that was clearly not worn at all. So what we should have gotten was um, distinction at least somewhere in here um, because you can see that you know look at all the wear here it should show up and look at nowhere here there should be a distinction or there should be discrimination and we got none at all 
Yeah, we goofed. We, we, we somehow measured the wrong places, or we may have gotten some measurements crossed over one another when we actually went to process them. I'm, I'm still not too sure where we potentially made the error. But the fact that on something like Shell, you get no discrimination at any scale um, indicates that there's a problem, a big problem. Um, because we normally would have expected uh, clear discrimination. In fact, of, of the three different samples that we contacted, we were sure Shell would be the one that would work, um, just based on you know, the hardness of the material. And it clearly didn't. So um, the example I showed you from Hyde generally worked out the way we, we thought it would. And the example for Wood worked out the way we wanted it to. Um, the Shell example is basically a blown example. Uh, something went wrong, and I think it's mostly because we we inappropriately chose the wrong places to measure, um, and and that's the product, or that produces our inability to discriminate between used and unused surfaces. Yeah. I guess how would you? And you saying I guess the other you sort of messed up and chose the wrong spot. How would you, or do you think you may go about choosing a better spot, or being more maybe systematic about? Yeah, well, one of the things we wanted to do was along the border of the obsidian, you have extremely roughened surfaces. I mean, it's all broken away. It's all worn away. And we knew that wear was there. So we avoided that because it was so obvious. What's the point? So we went in from that and we um, looked at that kind of what I'll call secondary area of usage where you don't get that heavy abrasion, but you get lots of striations. And we only measured in there uh, to see if we could distinguish the sort of striated surface that wasn't heavily abraded from the normal surface. So it was basically testing to see what can this pick up and what can't it pick up. Probably what I'm guessing is that, in fact, our data seem to suggest is we, we picked up two fairly heavily striated areas and then one very weakly striated area. And then we picked up three areas that weren't used at all, but with only three plot points or with only three scan areas, the um, the weighting of the one area that wasn't that heavily striated tended to matter much more when we then produced the mean. Had we done more surface area measurements, that probably would have offset that outlier that we had measured. Um, but you know, it was a learning process. It was you know, what what can we do? What can't we do? Um, you plot the, just the, the raw data that you scan. Uh, you 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 can. Um, see if it actually does that all there after having We do, and again, I don't have it here, but if, if we sort of look, look at these, what you get is, you know, sort of two of these go this way, um, three of these kind of go this way, but then one of these guys goes way off, you know, in the wrong direction. And it looks like that's the one that's the problem. But because there's only three, that one scan that goes way far off when you produce your mean affects the other two to a much more significant degree. Uh, and that's why only three measured areas uh, in terms of uh, what I'll call statistical reliability, uh, obviously is a problem. But, you know, it was, we're figuring out how it worked for the most part. I have kind of a general question. So you, you were talking about how you, when you went in from the, you know, the wear that's along the edge and it has all you know, yeah. the major fractures sort of are occurring. Um, did you, do you think, that, I mean, if you're sort of trying to dis distinguish function based on more materials and things like that, that the wear that's on the edge was there major differences in terms of like the robustness of like microflake fracture scars or we we stayed away from uh, microflake scars completely. Yeah. So we were only looking for what what would be characterized as polish. Yeah. So in selecting our areas, we wanted to stay away from anything that was was microflake scar ish. Let's put it that way. That's all shot would do. Well, that's, that's the problem. Is it, it, it abrades the edge away really quick, especially obsidian because it's such a brittle solid. Sort of like a so it does, but if you move a little bit in from the edge, what you get are striations that do form. And they're, they're pretty obvious. Um, you know, and we kind of picked a couple of good spots and picked, you know, a third spot that was okay, whatever. Uh, and that resulted in the results that, that we got. So, you know, it's, it's a lesson that you learn in terms of what the, what the technology can do and, and then human error. Uh, in the process of doing it. So, you know, at some point what we should do is replicate that shell sawing piece and then compare those new data to the previous data that we already had to see if, if that makes a difference. And it probably should, but just haven't done that yet. Or you could just do like a, a profile across the blade and that way you capture all of it. Yeah, yeah it's, mostly, it's mostly just time and sort of stitching that yeah. stuff together. Um, so, this clearly wasn't 
a perfect uh, first attempt, but it told us a lot that we didn't know before. And it's from this first attempt that we kind of followed up with, with a secondary attempt, which is the bloodletting piece. So this is really what I'm supposed to be talking about. All the rest of it was just setting this up. So based on what we learned with um, the first series of, of sort of experiments, uh, we decided to address a specific problem rather than just saying let's, let's cut a bunch of stuff that's different and, and see what kind of results we get. So this is uh, the application to a specific archaeological problem. In this case, it's this idea of bloodletting. So um, three obsidian blade segments. Uh, you'll notice that the amount of time that they're used is almost insignificant, so 30 strokes. But bloodletting implements aren't going to be used in fact, they're probably not even going to be used that long. So we're, we're even aiming at the high end of use here. And then they're clearly uh, cutting a very, uh, what I'll call, um, soft material compared to shell or, or wood or hide. So you have problem number two. Um, after the experiments were done, we, we cleaned them again. Uh, in this case, we changed the protocol a little bit because we were going to be dealing with um, sort of the residues of um, uh, fresh organic substances. We wanted this sodium hydroxide to cut any kind of the fats or any sort of other products that would still be adhering to the surfaces. Something that uh, hydrochloric acid doesn't do. So hydrochloric acid is, is good for sort of inorganics, things like calcium carbonates. Um, sodium hydroxide is better for the residues associated with organic materials. So in this case we, we chose a slightly different protocol um, because we thought that the substances that we were dealing with would leave different kinds of residues on, on the tools. Uh, you know, and then we examined them under a microscope to make sure that they were as clean as they, they could be. Um, you know, and this is just a picture of the tools that didn't come out all that clearly, or at least isn't coming out clearly here. Uh, same idea as before, so just replicating the, the methodology. In this case, though, we doubled the number of scans. So we took six uh, in the unused, or on the unused surface first, on each one of the blades, and then um, we took those blades and then we used them to, to cut the meat uh, and then cleaned them and then scanned, in this case, which is different, scanned the same surface uh, in the same location. Uh, and what we did previously was we scanned um, the used surface and compared it to the unused surface on a single tool. So in this case, we changed the protocol a little bit and we used the same place before and after. Um, and this is actually probably a better way of doing it. The problem is you don't get the opportunity to do that archaeologically. You don't get to test the tool before it's used and then retest it again after it's used. So this method can't work if you're recovering archaeologically used tools. You would have to use the other method, which is comparing an unused portion of one tool to the used portion of that same tool. So although we, we know that this won't have the same kind of direct application potentially for archaeological samples, uh, we're more concerned in, in whether or not we could actually discriminate um, the used uh, surface versus the previously unused surface. Yeah. As far as measuring the same spot each time, did you just eyeball the location? Um, after to get you in the same, you know, relocated well? Yeah, for the most part it was, it was eyeballed, but in, after doing the first measurements, you know, using more or less a, a, a piece of graph paper, we, we sort of, you know, traced the thing and said, okay, this is roughly where we were. So when I say exact location, it, in terms of, let's say, a, a, a GIS three-dimensional, this is where you are. Mm -hmm. We're close. We're probably not exactly spot on. Maybe have to scan field all of this. Like that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 where we had the images of the first scans, we could look at them and look at the second one and, and you know, you often... You could identify features. Yeah, we can take pictures as we're scanning at the same time. So we get a visual image of what we're doing. And that's what helps a lot in, in the placement. Uh, in this case, we got them as close as, as we could and under normal circumstances. But they're not perfect matches. Um, we would have to that we'd have to use some kind of mapping uh, software to be able to ensure. But when you take the thing off the, the stage and then put it back on the stage, you can't ensure you got it right back in the same place that you had it before. So that mapping software, if you if you applied it, the object had been moved. So you'd have to get the object back in the original place to use the software to map that area in the same place. So it has some some application issues associated with it. So this is um, what we get for the three individual blades. So a uh, same idea as the scale of um, as the scale of measurement decreases, we see that relative areas increase. But for our first blade, um, we get an outlier for the unused surface. And um, going back to the image of that surface, 
it looks like it hits a fairly significant what I'll call uh, topographic feature. So it looks like it hits a big divot uh, in the surface. And that divot seems to throw off this measurement compared to the others. So the other um, five down here in the unused surface um, all generally cluster very closely together in terms of measuring the same uh, surface of the same relative area. Um, we see that the used surfaces here <laughs> tend to cluster fairly tightly together. So this one, uh, as, you know, as far as we're concerned, is it's kind of a blown measurement again because it's, it's clearly measuring what the surface uh, actually represents, but it kind of gets in the way of what we we're trying to accomplish. So uh, we do what all good scientists do and we eliminated it. Uh, we just took it out. Um, so in this case, if we keep our original measurements, we see that um, they tend to work out pretty well. And the scale's changed up here, so that's why it looks like things have moved. Um, but this is the same series of measurements. The scale here has just changed. And we can distinguish our unused from our used, um, which is sort of what we were kind of looking for. Were you surprised that the complexity got higher? With, I mean, it got lower with the unused? Yeah, I mean, um, the complexity got higher with the used. Yeah, so our complexity gets higher with the use because if you think about a flat surface now having modifications to it, once you get very small scale tiles, those tiles will fill in all of these different kinds of surface areas. So as your surface becomes rougher, uh, what you'll see is that that relative area should increase. That was the, the one that's used there hanging out with the used one. Yeah, so in this case, the difference in terms of relative area isn't as significant. Do you think that's also like before an area that might have been miscalculated for where to measure it? Uh, in this case, um, this one, I don't think it's actually a, a sort of placement error. It's that in part when it was measuring, it, it hit a surface anomaly of some kind, but a significant enough surface anomaly. Uh, uh, yeah. Fissure things that we yeah. saw in the beginning. Yeah, those fissures actually don't seem to be as big a problem. Uh, when we go back and we look at the image, it looks like, it, it, for lack of a better term, it almost looks like an air bubble was in there or something right. like that when it naturally formed. Yeah, they have bubbles. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, so an impurity or a bubble. So I think what's going on here is uh, this was significant enough that it, that it made it look like, or in fact, it, it was recording what is a, a clear depression in the surface. Um, so part of these differences will be clearly topographic features. So if you're hitting more of these little steps along the way on the edge, they'll show up. If you're hitting fewer of them, they'll also show up. Um, here, um, you may also be hitting some of these steps at the same time, but in addition to that, what you uh, are or what we're arguing you're hitting is you're also hitting evidence of the wear on, on the stone tool. So, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, do you guys ever take into account the cleaning of them? Yeah. Like, I mean, you were talking about some of the other pro uh, tools found already having collagen on them. And yeah. Like that. So just don't clean them kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, these are all experimental pieces. So, I mean, when we recover obsidian uh, tools, they're not washed initially. So they're, they're kept the way they are um, with the idea that, that someone is going to come along and want to potentially do residue analysis. Uh, eventually, though, if, if this is going to work, those tools will have to be cleaned. Um, well, why do they have to be? Like, couldn't you do the same experiment, like get some tools and not clean them and do the uh, analysis on them? Controlling for... Uh, I believe you have more residue on the bottom one. Well, well, controlling for how much residue and the structure of the residue on them is, is so difficult that you would essentially, um, you would essentially um, nullify any, any meaningful results that you got. Plus, the residues cover the worn surface. So you wouldn't be measuring the worn surface, you'd be measuring the surface of the residues. I guess from uh, um, I guess that what scale you go to using even acid on something it might yeah and, and and this is the one of the big debates for for lithic analysis is what cleaning protocol should you use um, you know and how long should you have your artifacts sitting in, a, in an acid bath or, or a basic you know sodium hydroxide bath what, what's the percentage of the solution what should that be you know should you use ultrasonic tanks and you know Multiple people, yeah, multiple people have, you know, multiple uh, approaches. So this, this is something I think that we will have to figure out, you know. We, we will have to assume that the one approach for cleaning is, is the best approach under 
you know, considering all the possible issues. So, so you know. uh, obsidian is mostly silicate, right? Yeah. So nothing's going to Hydrofluoric. No, no, acids don't do anything to it. The concern isn't so much the acids, uh, the concern is the bases. We do know what happens is you, you get what, a, what I'll call a chemical patination of surfaces. Not so much with obsidian, but with flints. Uh, if you leave them in there long enough, the, the sodium hydroxide actually starts to patinate your, your surface. But you have to leave them in there for a long time, you know, so. And, and you have to have a fairly high concentrate in your in your solution but you know there's disagreements about how what you're supposed to do to them first whatever you do the argument is you have to be consistent obviously between your experimental tools and your archaeological tools that, that the cleaning protocols have to be the same um, so I'm not necessarily advocating that our cleaning protocol is, is the right one uh, I'm just telling you what it is so that you know if you're bored on a Saturday you have nothing better to do and you want to replicate the experiment you, you know what it is um, so, you know, we get reasonably good results for the first blade, you know, yay, we're, we're pretty happy. Uh, if we look at our F-test, what we see is it's not quite as easy to discriminate. Um, the, let's say, um, scales at which maybe we think the natural topography of the surface uh, can be distinguished from the used topography, topography of the same surface. So what we see is we get kind of a, a lot of discrimination all over the place. And this makes interpretation a little bit more difficult because you don't get, as I showed you in that earlier slide, you don't get kind of nice peak here and nice peak there. You kind of get, you know, a little peak here and then you get um, lots of discrimination all over here starting at a, a much higher scale. So this is a little bit harder in terms of the interpretation. What we, we think is going on here is that you're still getting um, discrimination of the natural surfaces themselves at the larger scales. But um, to what degree that discrimination at the larger scale starts to give way to discrimination at the smaller scales, this is where it's hard to know where that sort of transition is happening. And the fact that we don't have a nice cutoff whereby you've got you know, a bubble here, nothing, and then a bubble here makes the interpretation of, of what you're measuring more difficult. Um, we assume, again, that somewhere down in here we are picking up some of the discriminations that we see here. But where that's kind of happening is a little bit more difficult to, to sort out. So this is harder to kind of read in the same way that we read the other one, uh, which is kind of interesting because it, it makes sense on some level in that with very, very little wear, there really isn't a lot of distinction between the unworn surface and the very short-term, soft-contact, worn surface. So the fact that you, you, you don't get that big dip kind of makes sense, but it creates a problem in terms of interpretation. So then we, you know, figured, okay, well, we think we have a right Wait, roughly idea what's going on. Why, why would you expect It, at the middle, millimeter scale, we, we wouldn't necessarily if, um, or at least not associated with the um, characteristics of wear themselves, but characteristics of the uh, actual surfaces that are different from one another um, should be picked up, or at least based on our past experience, will be picked up at a higher scale here somewhere. So natural micro, micro topography of, of an obsidian surface is not uniformly distributed. As you're picking this stuff up, you should be picking up larger scale variation. It's not to say that the larger scale variation goes away um, in the used areas. It's just that the scale of measurement picks up smaller scale differences. So I'm not measuring a different area here and a different area here. I'm measuring all the same areas together. So it's the scale at which they show up as being discriminated. So at a larger sort of scale or sort of bigger tiles but fewer of them on a certain surface area you know I'm picking up certain kinds of anomalies or certain kinds of discriminations and then as the numbers of tiles increase but the size of the tiles decreases uh, I'm picking up different surface features here so these are all six of those surfaces together uh, it's not a comparison of one surface to another surface in different places so it's the scale of measurement that's showing me, in theory, certain kinds of very small wear features at the smallest scales 
um, that it can't see at the largest scales. But what it's picking up at the largest scales, arguably, are those natural micro topographic variations um, based on the previous work that was done. I'll sort of follow this along and then you can sort of question later if you want. I think with random sampling, you should take care of that. Um, our sample size is pretty small yeah, too, that's the thing, right? So if we had 40 surface scans, maybe, maybe we'd see a different pattern. So, you know, obsidian blade number one gave us some pretty good results. Uh, we checked obsidian blade number two, horrible results, mess. Um, so unused and used are, are can't be distinguished from one another. They're, they're all over the place, um, which is still important. It's a nice result, uh, but we're, we're struggling or initially struggling to try to figure out, well, why, why does it look like you can't discriminate um, between the used and unused surfaces as the, the scale of measurement uh, decreases? Because the assumption would be that you could. So, um, you know, we performed the F-test on this, and what we saw was that discrimination at the large scales, seemingly we can discriminate the natural surface topographies from one another uh, for the six different areas. But when it comes to trying to discriminate what we expect will be the, the worn regions from the unworn regions, there's nothing. So essentially what this is telling us is that it, it can't discriminate worn versus unworn on this tool. Is the, the macro, we'll say at this scale, is that swamping all of the variation then at the smaller scale? Um, it, it may not be swamping it. Um, it just may be that the variation at the small scale doesn't exist. Do you think it's idiosyncratic to that tool again? Like uh, in this case, I, I think so, and, and there's a reason for it that'll get to it at the end. Um, and this is why I think this is the reason, although, as I said, I'm not sure yet. So, you know, this one didn't quite work out the way we had hoped. So, obsidian tool number three, uh, it kind of replicates the same pattern as number one. So, what we get are our unused down here, our used kind of cluster up here. Um, same kind of problem a little bit, whereby it's hard to distinguish the large scale and then kind of a little bit of a gap and then the small scale again. What we get is large scale, um, it kind of what we'll call bleeds into small scale, if you'll pardon the pun there, uh, with a few areas of non-discrimination, uh, which again kind of makes sense if the, the difference between the worn and the unworn is actually quite minimal, that there is no easily distinguishable, uh, let's say, scalar difference, because in fact there's almost no surface difference at all between the worn and the unworn. That, that kind of makes sense. So what we see is that one and three tend to replicate one another and two doesn't at all. So that got us wondering, okay, well, what's, what's the difference between one, three, and two? What are, what are potential explanations for, for why this may be? So we went back or we went back and checked the measurements just to make sure we hadn't ruined something on, on, on measurement number two. And it doesn't look like there's anything wrong with the measurements themselves. Um, and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the calculations themselves. So um, by going back to the original tools and going back to the original surfaces, we tried to, to look at, well, what, what about the surfaces themselves are different? And that's where we noticed a big difference. Um, and just to sort of demonstrate where you compare all the means to one another, um, what we see is that, confirming what we'd seen in the previous uh, slides, is that the unused surface for the first one uh, can be discriminated from the used surface of the first one. The unused surface of this one can be discriminated from the used surface of this one. But uh, these two basically overlap one another in terms of means. There's, there's no observable difference in terms of relative area for both the used and the unused for the, the second tool. So uh, at least in terms of the quantification of the, the surface microtopography for tool number two, um, the two cannot be distinguished from one another. So this is sort of a, a summary of what I just told you. Um, but this starts to give away where we think the, the difference exists. Um, obsidian tool number one and obsidian tool number three actually have more similar surfaces to one another. They actually have more textured original surfaces. Um, obsidian tool number two has a significantly different original surface. It has a surface that lacks the same kind of texture or what I'll call stepping or those sort of lines that I showed you in one of those earlier slides. We think that those original surface differences account for at least part of the inability 
of the worn versus unworn surfaces of, of obsidian blade number two to be discriminated, whereas um, those of obsidian blades one and three can be discriminated. And I'll kind of show you why, why I think this works in the way that it does. So here is one snapshot of an area scan for number one. Here's one snapshot of an area scan for, for number three. These are actually surfaces that are reasonably similar to one another in terms of normal structure or natural structure. And this is sort of hard to see on these slides. But what we do get are um, certain examples of wear. So you get a little bit of a striation here. You get nibbling along this ridge. And if you look at some of the other ridges, you can see a little bit of nibbling on those ridges. Uh, here, the same sort of thing. Uh, you get nibbling along this ridge, get nibbling along this ridge, some nibbling here, and so on. So what we actually think is happening is it's not the contact material that's, that's directly wearing the surface. But as these little ridges catch in the meat, the meat detaches flakes. And the flakes that it detaches creates this sort of roughness and in some cases will drag some of those micro flakes across the surface and create a, a striation. So the meat in a sense is responsible for the wear but the wear is not characteristic of the contact material. The contact material is just somehow eating away or nibbling away at these edges. But if we look at number two, the original surface doesn't really have any of those surface, what, or what I'll call microtopographic anomalies at all. Um, so that we think that the, the meat through cutting activity is sliding over the surface a lot more easily and it's not really catching on anything and detaching small portions of the surface and therefore what we're not, we're not registering is any damage to the surface at all. So what this at least preliminarily seems to indicate is that you can, you can show that blades one and three contacted something but you can't necessarily show that blade number two did but there's uh, nothing that's obviously characteristic of the raw material itself that um, can be associated with the, the damage that's produced on the blades. So we, we sort of know one thing, but this potentially creates another problem further on down the line. Because if, if the ultimate goal is to be able to argue that a particular blade recovered archaeologically was used in bloodletting, not only do you have to show that it's used, but you have to show that it's used on a specific contact material. At least at, at this point, preliminary uh, examination suggests that um, if the conditions are right, and the conditions may be the, the natural topography of the obsidian blade to begin with, that you can show potentially use, but you, you can't necessarily show the contact material, uh, which you know, is kind of one of the old cornerstones of, of high power use wear analysis, is that you identify the contact material, which is in part what we wanted to be able to do here. So preliminary experiments uh, sort of under our belt, we, we know more than we knew before. Um, we, we think we have an idea of, of what's going on. But there may be a, a bigger problem uh, associated with the discrimination of um, where that can be associated with variable contact materials. Something that we didn't see in the earlier experiments with the obsidian flakes, mostly because they were used much longer. Uh, and they're also used on, on much more resistant and much harder materials. So where we have soft materials, short use, and, and now the combination of a certain original microtopography on the obsidian blades, that may in fact determine whether you can or you can't see any sort of use at all. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a problem, um, obviously, for, for certain kinds of applications when it comes to uh, archaeologically significant materials. So that's more or less it. Um, collaborators, um, from WPI who worked with me, uh, obviously Chris Brown who runs the lab and, and Surfrac, and then uh, Jaime Awe who's the director of the Institute of Archaeology in Belize was, was interested to see what we could come up with here. Um, and he hasn't, hasn't gotten these results yet so I'm not too sure how pleased or not pleased he will be. Uh, so that's pretty much it. As I said, you know, this is still another step in a preliminary uh, series of experiments. From the earlier experiments we, we had a better sense of how to tailor this uh, series of experiments. From these results um, we're really going to have to, I think, go back to um, uh, partially redesigning the experiment and then trying to account for what is essentially um, intrasource variation uh, in, the, in the structure of the material. 
Uh, something that we know obviously does matter uh, in, in other instances. Uh, what's interesting is that all of these blades came from the same core. So had they come from different cores or different sources, this, this might have been something that would, would make would be more easily sort of predicted or understood because they all come from the same source of raw material. What we've got is some very interesting uh, interest source variation, probably the product of the composition of the stone itself, but also the product of manufacture. So how one blade happened to come off in one way that another blade didn't seems to produce these surface structural variations that, at least in this case, look like they matter. But as I said, I'll just go back to this one or this one. You know, this is, this is hard to interpret because we can see clearly discrimination, but, but where are we picking up differences of different kinds? So is this, you know, mostly all just the variation in the actual raw surface or normal surface itself? And maybe we're only getting a little bit of kind of use-related discrimination here? Or is this just all of the larger scale variation on the surface? And we're actually picking up much more variation um, as the scale decreases that's associated with, with use. Uh, and that's mostly because we don't get something like this whereby this pattern looked like it was much easier to kind of interpret or understand. So um, let's say this was a B plus. Uh, you know, wasn't great, wasn't perfect, but you know, it was good. It told us something that we didn't know before. I know where you're trying to tell the question said. Um, and I think the other thing that's important is it, it does demonstrate that the, the technology can, can work for this kind of uh, application. So it can work on obsidian. We get good measurements from the system and we also get good results when we couple it with relative area and we also couple it with, with the F-test. So uh, it doesn't look like there are issues methodologically with those pieces. Those seem to work well. Uh, it's the, the actual application to the, the materials themselves that, that's, you know, um, it's a little bit more difficult. What was the material? It was actually a butchered piece of meat? So yeah, it's basically a uh, a, a, a portion of a, of a beef roast, let's put it that way. And the skin still? No, no. The skin, I think, would be... Yeah, very see, very that's something different. We got into uh, so discussions about repli replicability. So, you know, beef roast isn't the same thing. Yeah. But, you know, it seems to be fairly widely looked down upon to seek volunteers that, that you want to cut with obsidian blades I so you can... Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. IGBS, whatever they call it. Um, and, you know, doing it to yourself. That's a little weird. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> seem like it's a good idea. So, the, so there's also a potential problem with the proxy, too. You know, experimental replication of what you're trying to find, there's a distance here as well. So, you know, there's some pieces here that, that have some, some methodological experimental uh, obstacles or hurdles. And then there are just issues with, with maybe the materials themselves that are a little bit problematic that didn't show up as problems in, the, in the, the earlier pilot study. We didn't get the same, I think, variation in the raw material itself. And this was purely accidental. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that it was accidental because had all three of them been the same, our assumption would have been, yay, it works. And we wouldn't have known that if the raw material was different, that in some cases, in the second case, it didn't work. So, you know, what might be interesting is to produce three more that are similar to number two and see if none of them work out uh, and produce more of them that, that roughly have that kind of stepped or that more what I'll call textured surface of, of one and three and see if the results work out there. That would tend to confirm whether uh, the raw material really is responsible for, for what's going on. Plus the number of scans per tool should be increased just so our sample sizes are, are better. But It seems like a, as a non-archaeologist, it seems like you've done a great quality control tool for finding wear resistant Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and, and you know, completely, as I said, you know, happenstance, accident, we never, con we never considered that variation like that w would potentially contribute to the either ability or inability to distinguish uh, wear. But, you know, it's a nice discovery and probably squeak a paper out of it, so that's, that, that, that helps. Um, Exactly. Well, there you go. You know, something I never thought of is, you know, does it matter whether or not you're making those scalpel blades for eye surgery out of the one version of the obsidian versus the second? You know, maybe, maybe it does now. You know, who knows? So anyway, that's that's pretty much it. If you have any other uh, questions, I'd uh, I'd love to take them.
And uh, for those of you who have sort of posters upstairs that, that do do wear, I, I kind of collected all of your summaries. Um, and um, myself and a bunch of other people have obviously been trying to collect other people who are trying to quantify wear in different ways on different substances. So um, we're probably going to try to uh, suck you into the cabal, so to speak. Um, and, you know, just expand the applications of, of, of quantification technology to just variable surfaces, whatever they happen to be. Um, so, as I said, there's kind of a standing group that, that has fluidity built into it, but we're always trying to find out who else is doing the same stuff and get them in. Because often you learn a lot from, from somebody else's experiments and you learn either what not to do uh, or, or what works and you can narrow down your, your, your investigations that way. You don't have to you know, reinvent the wheel each time. I could do a session at one of the meetings, do like a surface analysis session. Yeah, we, we did one a couple of years ago at the SAA. There's, there's some other useware related one this year. Um, and if there's enough interest, I mean, we'll keep trying to get uh, more and more people involved. So, um, Thank you. thanks. You guys keep the <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> it is lunchtime, yeah. Uh, yeah, so at conferences like this, for example, and, and the SAA, wherever else, it's partly trying to track down who, who's doing similar things. Um, yeah, no, I haven't, I was actually trying to use this, you know, from sort of feasibility. Uh, well, I mostly was using, I've been using SEM. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, your poster's upstairs, yeah, right, with the uh, Middle Stone Age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but I basically was coming here as an exploratory thing, kind of. Yeah. This is, you know, I haven't done much of this, but I wanted to see 